Okay, hello and welcome uh, to CMS. So uh, we will offer you today a visit to the underground areas of the CMS experiment. So my name is Andres. I'm a, a physicist working with CMS for many years. And behind me, I'm Sonia. Uh, I'm here to guide you through CMS. I'm an astroparticle physicist, but uh, I like to guide in CMS. Uh, and in my past, I was a pure particle physicist on accelerator. <laughs> and then we have Malik. So I'm Sudhir Malik. I'm a professor of physics at the University of Puerto Rico, my grades, And I worked on CMS experiment uh, for the past 25, over 25 years. Great. All right. So um, yeah, so we can go ahead and get started. So uh, just to give you an idea of what to expect. Um, so Sudhir and I will stay uh, on the surface and should just share some uh, insights about CMS and what it's like to work on CMS. Uh, Sonia will head downstairs and show you the underground areas, which will be very exciting. Uh, so at the moment, we cannot access the detector, unfortunately, uh, but you will be able to see uh, and, and join us virtually to the underground areas. Um, yeah. And then Anders, I will take the chance to play a little bit with them and to show the effect of the magnetic field that we have uh, underground, even if it's not inside the experimental caverns. But we have a fringe magnetic field, and we can do something that you know that you will lose me because I like <laughs> so much this <laughs> this moment. And okay, uh, I hope that you will enjoy as I will uh, do. I'm so I, I so uh, I'm sure. And uh, okay, I think that I leave you the floor because I have to prepare. I have to wear some uh, some uh, objects uh, for safety. And then uh, I will uh, see you in a few moments. Okay. Thank so, you. See you later. Okay. See you. So um, maybe we can just uh, emphasize that if there are questions, uh, do we directly hear from the audience? Okay. So I have, have a microphone here. Right. I have a microphone here. So if somebody raises their hand, I can just bring the mic to them. Okay. Yeah, so um, this uh, is your opportunity. Whenever you have any questions, feel free to just uh, interrupt us and, and just ask any questions. <laughs> um, right, so uh, all right, we can start. Um, so we can maybe start with a picture of the area, right? And I think you're all familiar with the LHC. Um, so I've uh, spent a couple of years here in the Geneva area, and you can hopefully see the Alps in the distance. So these may look like clouds, but they're actually the Alps. Uh, and just a bit uh, closer to the view, that is uh, Lake Geneva. Uh, and you can, of course, see the, the yellow circle. Uh, this represents the LHC uh, underground uh, tunnel. So, of course, this the LHC itself is um, about 100 meters from the ground. And uh, we have different locations in the LHC tunnel where we have different detectors. So you can see from this photo here that uh, there most of the LHC facilities are underground and we have multiple access points. You can see that there is the access point for CMS closest to to your view, and then Atlas is furthest away. So Atlas is um, something like 20 minutes away from downtown Geneva, and CMS is about 20 minutes away from Atlas. Uh, so we at, we're at 0.5 here in CMS, which is sort of the furthest away uh, from the city, let's say. Um, and yeah, we have other uh, areas in the LHC. So we, we have actually eight um call eight access points and so point one is atlas point five is cms but of course in between we have a lease in point two in point three we have collimators i don't know if you're familiar with that we're not going to discuss much about collimators we have at point four uh which is very close to the jura mountains at point four we have 
uh, the RF systems of the LHC. So these are superconduct superconducting radio frequency cavities that provide the acceleration to the protons. Uh, and then 0.5, as we said, is just uh, deep into France. <laughs> and 0.6 is the beam dump area. It's also very, very interesting. If you have questions about that, you can let me know. And 0.7, we have uh, different types of collimator uh, for the LHC. And then in 0.8, we have LHCB. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of a, a tour around the LHC tunnel. Uh, there's a lot of complexity and a lot of things, but of course, today we'll mainly discuss CMS. Andres? Yeah. Andres, can you hear me? Yes, Sonia, go ahead. Yes, okay, and we are in CMS, 0.5. I was just uh, listening what you are saying. So we have the, the building at 0.5 and the below 100 meter underground, we have the experiment here. Now I just uh, drop in uh, to to show you what uh, what we have uh, all our, all around. Okay, we are uh, in a nice place. Today is uh, good weather. Uh, now we will enter this building, and it's quite interesting because we assembled the detector here. Let's start with the first record of CMS. CMS is the only detector who was uh, totally assembled on surface. All the others, uh, um, some pieces, uh, some detectors, as we, uh, we say, they've been produced in labs, uh, universities, and then they've been assembled in the experimental cavern underground. CMS was built, was assembled totally in this uh, hole that I will show you in a few moments. So just to give you a glimpse uh, of the sites of this detector. You can already see the, the building, you cannot guess. Now, I will be your ruler, I'm more or less uh, one meter and 60 centimeters, let's say. Don't ask me to convert in feet, please. I leave my colleagues, uh, I leave <laughs> my league to, to, to convert this, but okay, more or less, so you know when I compare myself to the, to the structures, uh, how, big they are okay so Sonia, can, uh, can i quickly add something so just behind you yes. there are these orange blocks ah and yes we can talk about this a bit later but this is something i was pointing out earlier this is part of what we call the new forward shielding mm -hmm. and this w goes around what we call the forward regions of the detector or like let's call it the end caps of the detector so these uh will be installed in the plus side. They're, they're already installed for the minus side. And these are meant to add additional shielding for the high luminosity LHC, which is the upcoming upgrade of the LHC and CMS and all the other experiments. We'll talk about that uh, just a bit later on, but I just wanted to highlight that. And that, that we, we can say that uh, we have uh, some parts of the detectors as this one, that they are, let's say, not fragile, of course, we can keep, we can store outside, but this detector is also other parts as a, uh, we will talk later, for example, the pixels, that they are very fragile and that we have to keep it to work and to, uh, to keep uh, really uh, with uh, accuracy uh, in, uh, inside. Uh, for install installation, etc. So now I I enter inside, and uh, maybe you can continue, and I will ask you again uh, the the floor when I'm inside, just to show this assembly hall and the picture, and then uh, it's okay with you. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. So maybe something else that is interesting that I don't know if if you're aware of this, but uh, CMS and point five, the facilities here are. Uh, one of the most recent in the LHC. So the LHC, uh, before it was the LHC, actually the tunnel was used for the Large Electron Positron Collider. And this was between the late 90s and 2000s, we had this, this uh, collider running with totally different experiments, totally different detectors. And then it was uh, sort of upgraded to the LHC itself, but there was nothing at 0.5. So this these facilities are one of the most uh, recent in, in the LHC infrastructure. Yes, exactly. I was following you, uh, Andres. In fact, uh, we had we had other caverns at the time. We were in our 
points. And the fact that we built a new cavern here and the one that is in the opposite, uh, let's say, with respect to the ring, is because uh, otherwise we would have uh, asked to stop the previous accelerator because when you have to dig, you have to make bigger structures, so you need to stop the collision. So in, in order to avoid the stopping of the previous accelerator, uh, other two caverns has been uh, dug in this point, P5, and uh, uh, in the opposite, close to the science gateway that I guess uh, you heard about the new visitor centers that we have since uh, last October. Now I go back to the experimental site and here, I don't know if you can uh, have the, let's say, the feeling of how far is the wall that I have behind me. So you can see a yellow structure. This is a crane um, for material that you have here. And, and basically the detector when it was a here was uh, starting in the point I am and going far towards the, the the wall that we have. Now another, now I do 180 degrees uh, turning and uh, we have here, you see now behind me, a picture is a real size picture of the cross section of this detector. Um, to give you an idea, I guess that we have seen uh, already the drawing about or you will see in a moment, but this uh, detector is, uh, allow me, it's not scientific, but give you the idea, is a long, a big Swiss roll, okay? So it's a cylinder, a sleeping cylinder. And when you cut the slice, you have this picture. I go close to the picture to show you, because I know that if I tell you that this is uh, equivalent to the high, is equivalent to the five, Five floor building, you do not believe me, but look your one meter and 60 centimeter here. Here I am. And this is the detector. This is what you have just below this floor at minus 100 meters. So you can get, imagine you can guess the size of the experimental cavern. Why I'm saying that is uh, here, because this floor I'm working uh, on is a movable floor. Uh, it slides back and uh, below here, there is a shaft. And this shaft is exactly from where, now Noemi, she's uh, dealing with the camera. This, uh, she's showing you the place where the, 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 this floor is uh, sliding back. and. Uh, through this shaft, we lowered the detector, or better, not the detector in one shot, it's impossible. Uh, the detector, the total weight of the detector is about 14,000 tons. Now, again, I like a practical uh, uh, comparison. One ton is more or less a city car, a small city car. So you get you you imagine fourteen thousand city cars one on the top of the other. This is the equivalent weight of CMS, and uh, there is no crane that can bring down this object in one shot. So this is why CMS, your Swiss roll, as I said, was built in slices as modules, and we lower the one slice per time through this shaft. Uh, the last thing I would like to say, and then I leave my colleagues to talk about uh, the structure, the inner structure of the detector, is that if we can see again the picture, uh, you maybe can uh, guess there is a, a green structure on the edges. Now, this is a, a grid, this is a cage that keeps together all the, the slice. And uh, you can imagine that this diameter that you are uh, you are looking at now is the equivalent diameter of the of the shaft itself. What I want to say that when we lower this detector, we were left just ten centimeters left, uh, ten centimeters light from from both sides. This is why we had to go to lower this detector very slowly down. It took uh, in average 10 hours to lower down each slice, in particular 12 hours for the 
a central one because there is uh, the the magnet uh, and was the heaviest one. The magnet is the the gray ring, a metallic ring that you see in the picture. Uh, I have I have a comparison also with food, but I don't know. It's an Italian food, so I don't know if it's okay. You can look on Google. Is a cannolo siciliano. Look for this because I come from Italy. Is a is an empty cylinder. Okay, I leave the floor now to my colleagues, and I go to the entrance of the experimental cavern. Okay, is thank it you. fine? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So maybe uh, just picking up with. Uh, what Sonia was just talking about. So she mentioned the magnet. And so as you hopefully already know, CMS stands for compact muon solenoid. As you saw, it's very compact. <laughs> so, okay, we say it's compact uh, when you compare it to Atlas. So CMS is about 15 meters tall. Atlas is 25 meters tall. Uh, but one of the reasons why CMS can be said to be compact is because we have a very, very strong magnetic field in the heart of CMS. And so CMS almost revolves around the magnet. So we have this superconducting magnet, which is six meters in inner diameter. It's a cylinder that's uh, maybe 10 meters long. I don't recall exactly, but let's say 10 meters. Um, and inside of the magnet, we have an entire detector. If you, if you don't care so much about muons, we have a full detector inside of the magnet. Uh, and yeah, this, this magnet is very much uh, a, a unique piece of, um, let's say, scientific instrumentation. So it is cooled down to cryogenic temperatures. We inject about 18,000 amperes of current, and we can generate 3.8 Tesla inside the magnet. Uh, now, outside of the magnet, we have the muon systems and there's a lot of steel. So Sonia mentioned there's about 14,000 tons uh, in total is the weight of CMS. By the way, the center slice that includes the magnet, the magnet that's about 2,000 tons. And um, that uh, outside of the magnet, the, this region of the detector has a lot of steel and that means 12,500 tons worth of steel. Uh, because the steel is used to sort of redirect or channel the magnetic field lines so that we can still generate two Tesla in those sections where we have the muon systems. So that's the main reason why uh, we have such a heavy detectors because of all that steel. In order for us to bend the trajectory of muons, which are of course carry more momentum, so they're more difficult to bend. So uh, maybe we go back to Sonia. Yes, I've stolen a piece of LHC, <laughs> you see? So this is the beam pipe. This was not used, of course, but this is a beam pipe. There is also a nice uh, hole here to see inside. And uh, we have a, a, a model uh, close by here. So I've just stolen the beam pipe just to show you from where the particle, the beam are going through. Consider that this diameter is huge with respect the cross section of the beam uh, that is typically a few tens of microns, so let's say less than a, a human hair. And that this parameter is so important that it is a proper name. It's called emittance of the beam. Our goal, if possible, is to reduce the emittance of the beam as much as we can, because in that way we can drive better the beam inside the, the beam pipe. And also because uh, the smaller is the, the, the cross section of the beam, so the emittance, the highest is the number of collisions that you can get with protons. Uh, maybe I can leave then uh, to explain the details to my colleagues. Now what I do, I leave this here, hoping that nobody is still in this uh, in the meanwhile. And I show you how I'm entering in the experimental uh, zone. So I have this door. This is door is for people, not for material. So I cannot bring anything. You see, I've, I've left uh, my, my beam pipe outside. Uh, what I have to do here, I have to pass three checks. One check is to verify that I'm human. So they say that the system is uh, checking if the weight corresponds to the, let's say, the typical weight of a human person. 
And uh, to do this, I have to step in. Maybe uh, Noemi can, uh, yes, can help me. You see here, there is a square with the yellow dots. So I step in here and the system is verifying that I'm human. Then the second check is that as I cannot introduce material or maybe this you see by helmet cannot uh, can be kept on my hand is on the head. The system activates also some infrared beams in that way. So this means that if I have a, a backpack, for example, the system doesn't want, is refusing me to enter. The third check is uh, to recognize myself as authorized person. And this is uh, the biometrical check. I don't know if you have uh, watched the movie Angel and Demons. Uh, the beginning of this movie starts uh, with uh, some issue about this. I will not spoil anything, uh, but it's this machine. In this machine, there is a reader for my iris. And uh, I have, of course, uh, CERN knows my iris and so recognize me personally and let me enter. If a three, these three uh, checks, uh, they works, I will see the door be open. Now I try, follow me. I will be recognized with my personal dosimeter to this one, this system, it's okay. And now I enter the door. Hopefully the door will close, okay, and then I will check my iris. A picture has been taken and I've been recognized. Now the same thing will be done by Noemi. Uh, I have to say she's a wizard because she's entering with the camera and uh, I'm always uh, looking at her because uh, she managed to cheat the system. <laughs> it shouldn't be said, but uh, she knows how to do I couldn't do this, it's not easy. Now you will see the, the check, she's doing the iris check. And then, okay, she passed, as I told you, she's a wizard. Okay, we are on, the, on this side, we have other doors, other entrance for per, people. They are here, as you see, you have other two doors. You can imagine that you can have many people entering this site. So there are other two uh, doors for peoples, for people, and then we have here in this side we have also a door for material. That is this blue door. So uh, Noemi, she's showing you how what is the policy to enter the material. There are there are double doors. So we open the doors outside. We put the material in between the two doors doors, and then we we badge through the green doors and we recover the material from this side. And here we have the elevator. It's a big elevator. You can fit uh, more than 30 people inside. It, now it's coming up. It takes more or less one minute to go down. And uh, usually mm -hmm. we lose the signal when we are inside. So as I will have shown you, uh, the in internal part of the, the lift. I will leave the floor to my colleagues uh, and I will uh, see you back uh, when I'm underground. So we are almost there, uh, almost arrived. And this is the elevator you would take uh, if you come here to visit the site in person. Okay, here we are. I block for a moment. You see we have uh, three levels here. So we have the zero, the surface, Minus one is more or less minus 80 meters, minus two more or less minus 90, and minus 100. We are going to the about minus uh, 90 meters. And okay, I say you, bye-bye. See you when we are underground. Okay, thank you, Sonia. So uh, maybe this would be a good opportunity if there are any questions uh, from the room outside. I see a hand, I think. Does the same beam pipe that was shown deal with the beam going in both directions? No, so at the LHC, we have two separate beam pipes. Uh, and so the the I beam, the going what, the, what you were seeing that Sonia was holding is called the beam screen. 
uh, and I can elaborate on what that is and what it's for, but um, the beam screen is inside of the dipoles. So of course there's 1,232 dipoles in the LHC and they bend the protons to keep them constrained to the tunnel. But there's two separate beam pipes for each direction for the protons. And then at the interaction points, these two beam pipes merge so that the particles can collide. Okay, you said that the uh, detector is 10 meters long, and I'm wondering if the magnet is also 10 meters long. Right, sorry, I said the magnet is 10 meters long. It could be eight meters, I don't recall, but are around 10 meters. The detector is longer. The, de the detector in total is uh, roughly 30 meters. Mm -hmm. Actually, this, this figure here should specify. Yeah. Overall length is 28 meters. Mm -hmm. uh, so the actually, this might help, so you can see that the in this uh, we're not sh sharing. Sorry, uh, you don't see the figure right now. But um, yeah, do, do you have a follow up question or, or is that what you're? He said he's good. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Sudhir, is there anything that you want to add? So I, I I just wanted to add a little bit about the detector that I worked on. It, are they able to see this picture? So Sultan, can we share the screen, please? Yeah. Oh yes, of course. So I'm going to talk in a minute about the innermost component of the CMS detector. So CMS detector is the general is is the complete name, but it has several sub detectors and we tend to call each sub detector also as a detector. So it can be confusing. So the one that I'm going to talk about is called the silicon tracker. As you see in the picture, the it points to the innermost part and it has two components, a barrel and the and, and the end caps. So that is the geometry followed by all the sub detectors. And, and anyway, so the most uh, uh, interesting thing about the pixel detector, which is made of silicon is that it has at the moment, the detector that is inside has about, you know, 125 million readout channels. And that is, you know, almost 80% of the CMS readout channels. And it serves as um, a tool or a camera to give uh, space-time information around the interaction point uh, up to a resolution of about 10 microns. So that is very vital if we want to discover, you know, new physics or new physics signatures. And so it's critical uh, in, in, in that uh, respect. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So maybe just to... My... Oh, sorry, Sonia, go ahead. Uh, no, no, no. I wanted just to add something uh, to this uh, that Malik said. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, I'm always trying to make comparison. Now, I know that uh, if, if we compare, it happens also to me when uh, something that I have built uh, with uh, common life, daily life things uh, can be strange. But however, pixel is this, just this that you have in your pocket. Okay, of course different kind of pixel, different, uh, uh, let's say, quality and different also electronics. But these are the screen of your mobile phones are pixel. And uh, I think I'm not wrong to say that when Malik was working on pixel, we, we still didn't have this in our pockets. So this means that when you come at CERN, you are dealing, you are working with the future. So if you get this in the daily life, because there is a fundamental science, a people as me and my colleagues, I and my colleagues uh, trying to understand strange things to invent and to develop new technologies that then we can use in the daily life. I close and I give you, leave you the, the floor and then I, I take back here. Yeah, so maybe it's... Uh... Yeah, to follow up on that, the CMS detector as it currently is, uh, is what we're describing today, but I've already alluded to the the upcoming upgrades. So we'll try to talk a little bit about what's coming in the future. Uh, and there are major, major upgrades coming for the inner detector, the silicon uh, pixel and strip tracker. Um, but maybe to first finish uh, the story with the current detector that we do have, if we share the screen again, I could uh, show you. Uh, so Sudhir was uh, describing the innermost parts of the detector, and we have a pixel detector, uh, which again uh, it has silicon sensors similar to a camera phone, uh, a phone, uh, well, a photograph uh, sensor. 
Uh, and then we have the silicon strip detector. So there we have silicon sensors, but instead of individual pixels, we have actually strips uh, that collect the signals and uh, we read out their position that way. Then we have the electromagnetic calorimeter and the hadronic calorimeter. So these are both based on scintillators. Uh, if you're not familiar with scintillators, it's a material that will produce light when it's hit by an energetic particle. And these two calorimeters focus on sort of two different types of particle that um, they can detect. So there's the electromagnetic calorimeter that can, it mainly detects uh, photons and electrons or positrons. And then we have the hadronic calorimeter that uh, mainly detects particles that are made of quarks, uh, which we call hadrons. Uh, and then here you see the magnet and then the rest of the detector outside of the magnet, it's essentially dedicated to muon detection. Uh, in the muon, the muon systems are all gas-based detectors, but we have four different technologies in CMS one of which is at the moment sort of a prototype for the high luminosity LHC. And you can kind of see from this figure that we can identify the type of particle that is produced in the aftermath of the collisions based on these, um, on the sort of signals that are left behind in our detector. Um, okay. Um, so I, yeah. I guess uh, as Andres was referring to, is stepping to the current detector, but there's an upgrade happening. So just with respect to the detector, which is called Pixel that I described, in future, we'll go from 125 million readout channels to 2 billion readout channels. And that's like a nightmare in terms of electronics, in terms of pooling, in terms of readout. So those are the challenges and the technology we use to meet those challenges, you know, bring in the, uh, the spin-offs in the society as well. Okay, so... I don't know if, uh, okay. So one more thing uh, that I wanted to also discuss is um, the, the CMS detector as a whole has what I would say a, a very lengthy lifetime. Mm -hmm. When you consider the, the LHC, um, just CMS, as Sudhir was saying, his be he has been with CMS for more than 25 years. So the start of the collaboration is now more than 30 years ago. And we started collecting data only on. around 2010. Mm -hmm. And we anticipate to continue collecting data until at least 2040 in, uh, in the LHC as it is, right? So we're going towards this high luminosity upgrade phase, but then we will continue to uh, operate the CMS experiment for, um, yeah, quite a, at least 20 years from now, hopefully. Andres, can you listen to me? Yeah. Sonia, can, can you ahead. hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to say that this is another. Okay, I'm trying to 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 cover other, let's say, parts of of, of the science. Let's say the fundamental science. For example, when you do these kind of projects that they are lasting 40 years mm -hmm. or even more, this is also because, okay, of course, they are very expensive uh, because you can imagine what you have to build uh, new things and develop new things, and uh, you want to use it uh, as much as possible. This is why, okay, we have to squeeze the lemon as much as possible until uh, at least other 20 years. Now, okay, if I can just, because I want to enter to show a little bit of the counting chamber, uh, the, sorry, the counting room, and then uh, going uh, uh, where we can fill the magnetic field, uh, just to tell you that, okay, I don't know if you have seen, uh, okay, now this is minus one because the elevator is moving, uh, but uh, we are in minus 87.9 meters underground. And here is uh, a safe place uh, in case of an evacuation alarm. Uh, this is a safe place we can wait for the elevator before going up. We um, uh, we have, the, you see, the fire doors, and uh, uh, this zone is overpressurized, means that, okay, the air is pumped outside. So if we have a gas leakage or a smoke, for example, nothing can enter. Now, I just enter here. This is the real experimental uh, zone. Uh, I use my hands and then when I, uh, I'm inside the country room as I cannot really speak too much because you don't, you cannot listen to noise, but it's very noisy. Uh, I just want to give you with my hands, maybe you can put a, a map, uh, the situation. Here we have two caverns, they are parallel. As my 
pants. And uh, we have uh, this one where I am in, I'm just in the middle, is called the service cavern. Uh, I will go towards the end of this cavern. And in parallel, so on this side, on my right, I guess your left, we have the experimental cavern. We cannot access now where the detector is. What you can see more or less here is, uh, I don't know if you can have, get a glimpse of the minus 100, uh, that is uh, the, the floor below where you see this uh, yellow structure. And uh, there is a wall uh, that is a, basically is a corridor that now is uh, totally filled with the concrete uh, blocks, but we can re remove these, uh, these blocks and we can enter directly the cavern when we, there are no conditions. So this is also the reason why we have this shaft here that is a, a different one respect to the, the previous one, is smaller uh, and we bring material up and down. The light that you see, I know this is a typical question when visitors are coming here, I tell you, is a CMS and art. So CMS is very sensitive to artistic, the artistic side and how science can be connected to other, uh, let's say, subjects. And this is just to say that data, they are taken underground and then they are brought uh, on surface to be analyzed. Now I go here, is the country room uh, for my colleagues, I will, uh, I hope that I recognize that we show the, the, the electronics of the pixel side and then the electronics that I, I consider that I consider the Mona Lisa of cabling. But you will see, I, I will talk not too much because it's very noisy here. Okay, so I can try to, let's say, narrate as uh, Sonia is showing us around. And yeah, one of the things that is very nice about these virtual visits is that we can go and show you locations in the un underground areas that are not accessible to visitors. So this actually is where the pixel, just at the very end of this, uh, towards the wall. So at the very, very end, we have uh, at the end on the right, you will see uh, around here, blue pixel feds. Uh, yeah, so you can see here that these are what we call the front end drivers for the pixel detector. They can read. So what uh, these devices do is that they are receiving optical signals from the pixel detector and they have to decode this optical information and uh, digitize exactly where we saw a hit and in which position, which sensor, and uh, what uh, what is sort of the signal strength of that of that hit. Um, yeah, so for the pixel detector, this is the, the readout. Um, but of course, in the cavern, we have lots of different uh, readouts and also services for the detector. So most of the signals that are, uh, let's say, sent by the detector, right, the, the signals that are produced by the detector are uh, sent via optical fiber optics. Uh, and this is to reduce latency. We need this information really immediately because we cannot possibly collect every single uh, collision or interaction. So we have to decide which are, let's say, interesting collisions or events, as we say. And we do this with uh, uh, the trigger system, which is actually a, a two level system. We have the level one trigger, which is an unattended. Andres? Yes. Before you talk about the trigger, just because here is very noisy, I wanted to, to explain also the other wall that, that I go there, just to uh, let our audience pay attention about the cabling, uh, the arrangement of these cables, uh, how regular, how uh, you need, it's a really a work that takes hours to be done. And if you see each cable is its own length and then you have to group, you have to put the labels. So this is uh, something that can, can, you could judge to be annoying or boring, but is not. You are very proud of yourself when you have done just a, half of this work in a day and you press the, the switch on the button and everything works. I will show you the other wall is uh, for another part that 
will be shown by by uh, Andres is quite impressive to me. We do not enter too much here because uh, you know, if at home you have uh, you have uh, a DDP, a different a differential put, a, a potential uh, a tension of about uh, two hundred or uh, volts. Here you have a uh, twelve. Uh, Hundred twelve thousand kilovolt, uh, twelve uh, kilovolts, uh, twelve thousand uh, volts. So this is very dangerous. But uh, look at this wall. This is so regular. This has taken uh, hours to be done, days to be done. But I can tell you that you are really proud when you have done this. Each cable has a, he, its own length to be driven by one connector to the other. I leave you the floor again, and I go almost to the end of my tour okay if so yeah so are we there have, questions uh, comments uh time queue we have 15 minutes okay all right thank you right so um yeah i wanted to point out so we sonia was just showing you before these red cables correspond to the resistive plate chambers which is one of the muon systems and of course, the we have high voltage, low voltage. We have cooling uh, fluids. We have gases that we have to provide to the detector. There's uh, things like uh, dry air that we have to provide to keep certain parts of the detector dry, and so on. So there's many, many services, and there's also lots of readout. And so that's what's mainly happening in the service cavern. And what you were seeing, by the way, is just one of two separate floors uh, for this counting room or service cavern. Okay, so maybe we can hand it over to Sonia. Yes, I'm here. So I told you that I have this cavern. I'm inside the service cavern. I, I entered in the middle and I stepped back, uh, towards the end. This is the end. Uh, there is this red door. On the other side, you, can, you have a corridor and you can go to the LHC tunnel. Uh, but this door is not here for that reason. You see, this door is a second, a second escape path because there is also another emergency uh, lift. So we have a second lift to go uh, to reach the surface in case of an evacuation alarm and in case I cannot go back through the path that I've fallen now. If I turn just 90 degrees from here, I have another connection that could bring me to the experimental cavern. Now it's not possible to access the experimental cavern, as we have said many times, but this is the path. So if you come here to visit CMS, you will be, you can also experience this place. Just let me say something that is again another record of CMS. I'm stepping here on the other side, not in this moment, but soon there will be collisions. Uh, this is the only, CMS is the only experiment that allows people, visitors to go underground, even if you have a collision on the other side. This is because of this second uh, elevator I've told you, because uh, to reach the second elevator, you don't need to go through the experimental cavern. The other three experiments that they require, in case we have to use the second escape path, to go through the experimental cavern, and this is not allowed at, uh, at CERN. So in any case, if you come any time along the year, you win, because either you enter the, the experimental cavern, or you do what? You can feel the magnetic field. And I will show you, I have a very expensive detector here. I have two, to be honest. Let's see which one is the best. Uh, can you recognize this? You see how very nice clips I have, you see? Okay, uh, I will use these clips that, as you see, they are not magnetized. Also this one, I can try. Uh, this is a little bit uh, tricky because there is some plastic around, but however, they react more or less. Let's go to probe if the magnetic field, we can feel the magnetic field, uh, the fringe magnetic field from the detector. Come with me 
And let's see what happens to these chains. I hope that you can see the two. And the, my colleagues in the control room, they didn't switch off the magnetic field. Otherwise, I'm lost. Okay. We yeah. try not to. <laughs> yeah. Can you see this? Can you see this? Yeah, we see it. Okay. Of course, it's not me. I, I, I don't want to sell you that I'm magnetized and so the chain are. I'm not <laughs> magnetized. <laughs> Only the chain they are. So let's take this one. I don't know if you can see. If uh, is uh, is it visible the one metallic because this reacts mm -hmm. better than the, the other one, so uh, I can do this for example. Look, you see, it's not me. This is the 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 clips that they are here, and uh, we are now. If uh, I take this uh, off here, um, this wall that you see behind me. If I could make this wall transparent, you would have uh, the detector more or less 30 meters from here. So this is uh, the fringe magnetic field that we feel in this uh, point, in this uh, place. And uh, maybe I leave my colleague to explain why it's a fringe magnetic field is not uh, the the total one. One is because we are not in the magnet, but then we do also another manipulation trying to keep the magnetic field all around the detector. And these I leave because they are pictures that I don't have. I will continue just very fast with my uh, show because this is a sort of show. And uh, I show you another funny thing. The first one is a pendulum. Now you see, I have the screws here. The screws, they are, they magnetized. This wall, they do not magnetize. So look, we could have a pendulum. We could measure time here, you know? <laughs> or we can have what I call the magnetic swing. You see? And then I can make this oscillating. Please believe me. If I do this uh, thing and uh, I pay attention, I feel... Uh, this chain as a spring, pushing my finger back, okay? Now, this that is a, a very simple object uh, can be used also as a, de a detector. First, a qualitative detector, why? Because uh, once it happened to me, this is only from experience, it happened to me that I couldn't keep the two clips on the, on the, on the, on the two screws. Uh, it was falling down. After a few times that I tried, I understood that there were too many clips. So I removed some clips from this and it was working in that way, let's say. And then I went to the control room to ask uh, what was happening with the magnetic field because usually I was using uh, more clips and they could stick. And uh, the shift leader told me that the reason why we, I couldn't do the same uh, that day was because uh, they were running, uh, they were using half intensity magnetic field because that would the, there was a problem in the morning. This was in the in the in the afternoon. This means that uh, I did I couldn't uh, really know exactly the the magnetic field, how much was the magnetic field, but I could at least understand that it was lower than usual. Now, imagine if I could associate one clip with an amount of magnetic field. I could really measure roughly, of course, the magnetic field intensity. Now, other two things, and I, and I come up. One is this one. I have all my tools, you see here. So I take another clip just to play a little bit. Let's see if my mobile phone is totally black. Uh, and now look. Sonia. I, yes. I have a proposal. Uh, you, yes. you showed uh, these very important and very interesting things, but in the meantime, uh, we would ask for questions. What's your opinion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I show you if uh, if there is any question about this, I don't need to explain. I guess people understand very well that this is a compass. <laughs> I show sure. if they have a question about what I'm doing, I can answer. Otherwise, uh, my colleagues or I, we can ask their questions, okay? For me, it's okay. 
Okay, so let's see if we have questions from the audience. I, I have a biological question for Sonia. I want to know, is she feeling down 90 meters pressure like in her ears or wherever else? No, okay, let's say uh, when you are in the elevator, maybe you can feel the difference sometimes. Okay, you can feel uh, that you're, uh, for example, you're here, they, you cannot uh, listen very well, but this is not all the time. So, because there is a, uh, the conditions, you know, they are very, very similar to outside. And uh, I can tell you also another thing that you didn't ask me, but uh, I had the chance to enter the cavern with the magnetic field. And uh, at least uh, the position we can reach, uh, you can feel all the objects, uh, the uh, me metallic objects uh, to magnetize, but from the point of view of uh, biological thing, you don't feel anything. Uh, the only issue that I had, because uh, today I don't have, but uh, I had uh, some uh, hearings and they were moving uh, because of the magnetic field inside my ear. And when I went back in the, in the evening, uh, I felt a little bit of pain. Uh, the first time I couldn't understand why. And then I realized because uh, you know, the earring was really pulled inside the, the hole. And so there was a sort of infl inflammation that I got. But this is uh, not, let's say, is uh, a consequence of the magnetic field pulling my earrings uh, that magnetize. For the rest, uh, you can, uh, okay, I could have a picnic here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we have time for one more question. A little bit earlier, was the plastic clips deflecting also? From the picture, it looked like they were. That was a plastic coating so, on a, on a yeah. steel. So it's just a so we'll, plastic coating on metal. Paper, yep. uh, metal we have clips. one more question actually over here. Hi, thank you. Um, you were mentioning that the detectors are gas-based or that, that there's gas in the detectors. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah. Um, Sudhir, do, do you want to discuss a little bit or should I? Sure, so the, the, the only thing I can say about the pixel detector I mentioned, you know, it uses uh, carbon dioxide two-phase uh, cooling to cool the pixel detector. So that's one of Maybe the kind of gas that is that runs in the pipes then, and it efficiently cools down the, the pixel and the silicon strips uh, detector. But then there are, uh, you know, gases and all possible uh, uses uh, in the detector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. so so I also wanted to this, uh, just say a word about the muon systems. So the muon systems all are gaseous detectors. And so we have four types of uh, muon detectors. So I mentioned RPCs, these are resistive plate chambers. We also have CSCs, which are cathode strip chambers. We have DTs that are drift tubes, and we have GEMs that are gas electron multipliers. Lots of acronyms. There's going to be a quiz at the end. Hopefully you are paying attention. <laughs> so all of these are relatively similar. Uh, they, they use, I mean, in fact, they're not very different from uh, a silicon-based detector. In a silicon-based detector, you have uh, the silicon itself ionized by the passing of a charged particle. So this charged particle will kick out uh, electrons from the atoms in the silicon. The same thing can happen in a gas-based detector. You have a specific gas mixture and you are keeping these, and similar in, in silicon, you keep it this under a very strong uh, electric field. So when the material is ionized, and in this case, the gas, when the gas gets ionized, then you can collect the charges that are liberated by the charged particle that passes by and you see a signal in this uh, gas that in this gas detector so the gas mixtures are all slightly different and there's all types of gases that are used uh, in the uh, gas detectors um this hopefully kind of answers your question if you have something more specific yeah okay good so you can see that there's still a lot of uh, ongoing sure. activity with the- Can you see the clips? Field. Yeah. Can you see the clips, how uh, they react to the magnetic field? Yeah. We are just enjoying, look, look. We are discovering with you, this is the first time we are doing, uh, we never did this, okay? 
and you see this. Oh, yeah, they're dancing. Yeah. Yes, yes. Also on the floor, huh? It's not just there because it's metallic. Mm -hmm. You see, on the floor, I can keep them all. And then, okay, I I just uh, show you this, and then I come up. For example, you see, I have taken some of these clips, but if I move around, you see, they fall down because here the magnetic field is less than where I have collected them. You see, I collect here, but then if I move around a certain point, you see, the drops because it means that there is the magnetic field is not uh, uniform. Okay, I I. Recover all my stuff and coming up. Okay. So just so just to close the loop on what uh, Andres was describing, what's important to realize is that different kind of gases are used for different purposes in CMS. So as Andres described, the the gas and neuron detector is used to detect. You know, it ionizes and and it creates electronic signals. The one in pixel detector, which is carbon dioxide, is used for cooling. And similarly, we have helium that's used for superconducting magnets. And we also use nitrogen, which is a, which, which actually cools down the thing that cools down helium. So the <laughs> gases are used everywhere in different uh, capacity. Yeah, and maybe to, I mean, just as, a, as an interesting detail. So the pixel detector is actually in its second generation, let's say. So we initially in 2009, actually in 2008, we started, uh, with the first generation pixel detector and it was replaced in 2017 with the current generation detector. And so it was the second generation detector that this, this current generation detector that implemented the CO2 cooling, which it's runs uh, quite a bit colder. So that's, we're talking about minus 35 degrees centigrade or so. Um, and so in a number of years, I'm not gonna say how many, but in, in let's say five years or so, we, will have a new pixel detector that is uh, innovative in many different ways, but I'll just name one. So we'll have uh, an inner detector that will participate in the trigger, which I mentioned is sort of the unattended way in which we select the interesting collisions or interactions. Um, so there's a lot to say about the upgrade if there are questions about that. We didn't even mention the high granularity calorimeter, uh, there's also the timing layers, and then there's upgrades from the LHC, and there's the trigger upgrades. So lots of activities going on uh, looking towards the future. But uh, I'll leave it up to uh, anyone in the room who, if, if there's time for any more questions, hopefully. And there's only okay. one thing uh, as they ask questions, uh, just to show that I cannot go uh, beyond this point. This is uh, sealed, and I cannot go uh, beyond this point, uh, this would be the access to the to the cavern, but I cannot go, as you see. I and I come up, okay. One one thing I can quickly mention is that CERN and CMS and all experiments, we are very very well aware of the that we need to be green as much as possible. Uh, okay. You know, so so in the initial pixel detector we had use uh, for cooling we use chlorofluorocarbon which is not environment friendly so we decided to switch to carbon dioxide cooling so so this is one example uh, that that we we really really deeply care uh, you know for the environment as well environmental impact of of the research we do i think we have many questions but unfortunately I have to make the audience angry and stop now. <laughs> I, I would like to give a special thanks to Sonia and Noemi who went down into the tunnel, to Andres who is our tour guide, <clears throat> to Zoltan who helps run things behind the scenes, to everybody else who, who was involved in this. And a special thank you to Sudhir because he has been a great friend of CorkNet over the last several years. Anybody who's going to Coding Camp 2, either this year or next, that funding almost, comes almost entirely from Sudhir and one of his grants. So thank you very much for being such a great friend to us. They are just saying it. Yeah, so this was a... Yeah. Uh...